Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's expert webinar. My name is Aaron Samuel from Spring People. Spring People is India's biggest corporate technology training company. As a part of our expert webinar series, we are glad to have Mr. Vishal Chahel, Chief Architect for Cognitive Solutions, IBM. If you have any questions during the session, please type in the questions in the question box. End of the session, Mr. Vishal will answer all your questions. Without any further ado, over to Mr. Vishal. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, an about, it's about an hour's talk that I'm going to do, probably 40, 45 minutes of uh, my slides, and then the uh, rest of the time we can do Q&A. Just hold on for your questions till the end of it. Um, I'm going to go in a flow, a lot of slides to cover. Um, so um, I, I think for, for um, everyone, uh, to just be on mute so that there's less amount of disturbance for everyone. So having said that, let's get started. So today's session is about AI and ML, state of the art and the future. Now, AI stands for artificial intelligence and ML stands for machine learning. Um, we, we pretty much um, a lot of times we hear that, um, you know, machines are going to take us over, computers are going to be smarter, they will control us, etc. But if you, if you look at the way currently we're going, the trend that's there, they have already taken us over, just that they're too stupid. So you have a mobile phone that you start with in the morning. AI and ML are going to make a difference to this world, right? So that the machines that have already taken us over are not going to be stupid anymore. Um, but here's one of the things that has happened, though. I'm showing a chart which actually shows you the, the Google trends over a period of last um, four to five years. And what you would see is AI per se actually started buzzing pretty much earlier than machine learning, right? So what that means is essentially AI per se as a subject was always in the reckoning, but the enabling technologies around it were just catching up. So, you know, AI was buzzing around 2014, but the enabling technologies of big data, machine learning, deep learning only came about after 2015, especially 2016, 17 when uh, machine learning and deep learning really caught on. Um, at this point of time, if I have to tell you where are we, we are actually part of the hype cycle um, in the peak of inflated expectations. So if you look at the graph, if you look at the x-axis on the time scale, uh, we are somewhere at the second point from the left, peak of inflated expectations. So what's happening is from deep learning, machine learning, um, all, all these kind of things, we are actually expecting a whole lot of stuff. But what's gonna happen is, it actually goes uh, into a trough and then uh, enlightenment occurs and that then, then the uh, plateau of productivity is gonna happen. But as of today, we are into uh, too much of expectation of what AI and ML can do for us. Um, you know, one of the examples of enlightenment is around video and image um, anal analytics that happens or, or simulation that happens, right? Those, those, are, those are kind of mature technologies compared to AI and ML today. Now, if I have to give you a perspective about how does this whole thing fit in, right? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. So the way, the way this is um, um, there is that you have, um, you have artificial intelligence, and I'm gonna come to uh, how do you define that later. So you have artificial intelligence. Under that, one of the ways of doing AI is machine learning, right? And one of the ways of doing machine learning is deep learning. Right. And what has happened is if you look at the time scale that's being shown on this graphic below is that AI obviously caught on pretty much earlier and started maturing compared to the enabling technology. So AI is not something that, that just happening now. AI has been around. The enabling technologies only caught on after about 1990s type of thing. Um, the difference that if I have to say between a deep learning, machine learning and AI, AI I'll hold on for now is for deep learning, you do not have to really prepare the data when you want to give it to a machine, right? You give it an image, it's going to find it's a cat or a dog. In case of machine learning, uh, the difference would be that you would do some amount of feature engineering labeling with the data for it to be able to really predict on the data, right? So, you know, deep learning, you don't have to do too much of feature engineering. In case of machine learning, you have to do some amount of feature engineering. 
AI, I, I'm going to come to. Now, at this point of time, after about 2010, we have entered into the modern AI era. Now, what is the difference between a tr traditional AI and a modern AI? Is that in, in the traditional AI, it was mostly driven by machine learning, right? It was feature engineering. You actually had to, so feature engineering uh, in a simple way is you have data. So let's say you have data in a CSV file or Excel file, and you have to do feature engineering around it. You have to put column labels. This is age, this is gender, this is salary, this is predicted um, you know, growth. All, all those kind of things actually had to be engineered by humans. And then you actually fed it to a machine learning algorithm, which would actually predict on that data, right? So humans had to annotate the data types. And obviously the competition was sequential. What has happened in case of modern AI is you do not actually have to do feature engineering. What you can do is there is a hierarchical way of doing things. You can teach a lower layer of uh, uh, a model to really understand basic features and that that in turn can actually go to a higher um, uh, layer of model which understands concepts which can even go higher level which can do some amount of learning on its own so you don't have to label the data so today the data can be unlabeled right and you can take multiple decisions simultaneously more importantly the processing power between where the tra traditional ai was versus where the modern ai is is humongous, right? Today you have mobile devices which are more powerful than some of the laptops we, which we had about five years ago, right? So you have an era wherein modern AI is actually more about machines being able to understand the data, interpret it, and, and do something about it. Now, what is that they have to do something about it? So what is artificial intelligence per se? If we have to put it together, so you have humans, who actually are supposed to be rational, have to have some thought, and they have to have some behavior. If we put that in a quadrant kind of thing, what happens is that we expect that humans uh, and systems are gonna come together in such a way, systems can think like humans, systems that can act like humans, right? Systems that can think rationally, and systems that can act rationally, right? That's, if you put it all together, that's what AI is supposed to be. Now what's happening today is, if we look at the current trend and where the te technology stands, is we, we are at a quadrant of human and thought. So there are systems that are starting to think like humans, like on, only, in the sense of, only in the sense of identifying things just like humans do. Uh, there are robotic systems that have been AI driven that are starting to act like humans. So those are humanoid robots. Um, as far as the right side of the quadrants go uh, on the rationality part of it, there still are not systems that think rationally. There still are not systems that can act rationally. All of that still is controlled through humans now. Now, in brief, if I have to say the status that artificial intelligence has today from a technical point of view is inferential statistics. So that, that, that's a very crazy word to use. I mean, you, you, you may have heard AI being really big deal, but the, but the whole thing is statistically data is taken, whether it is feature engineered or not, labeled or not, you have some statistical regression algorithm, um, you know, applied with with um, uh, with with some weightage and all that. So if you if you you know if you recall some of the maths we used to learn at around ninth standard, tenth standard, you used to have um, regression uh, equations, right? So um, it, it is simply doing that. But what it is doing with that uh, equations is it is actually inferring things based on that. So today, uh, when, when you want AI to identify a cat versus a dog, it is actually taking a statistical in, uh, you know, inference of that data and actually saying, if I see more of the weightage around this, then I think it is a cat. If I see more weightage in the data around this feature, then I think it's a dog. So that's what AI is today. But uh, if you look at some of the areas and some of the dependencies that are being talked about around AI, AI essentially started with search per se, right? Even though machine learning, deep learning was being applied gradually, 
And, and um, I think some of the search engines actually started applying the contextual part of the search as, as application or AI, right? That essentially resulted into natural language processing, you know, short termed as NLP. Um, obviously, when you had to improvise on the search, you had machine learning coming in. Um, you you all always had a way wherein when you were searching, is there a way, visual way that we could search or is there a visual way we could compare? So vision came in. But most of the other stuff, other boxes that you see are still to mature. So logic, for example, AI doesn't have today a way for us to represent the logic apart from the programming paradigm. So today the logic is represented using programming languages, C, Python, Java, R, or some of the newer ones, right? But there's no, there's no standard way of representing logic for AI today. Similarly, for knowledge representation, there there is some amount of standardization that's coming in, but there's no, there's no accepted way um, across all the technology vendors today as to how do we represent knowledge that can go into AI, right? Um, there are, Wikipedia is probably one of the ways, let's say, right? There are, um, you know, industrial frameworks that do some of the knowledge representation, but, but there is, there's no acceptable format today that everybody is going to go after. And obviously, um, the planning part of the AI is never being talked about. So you actually have to plan what you want to act on, right? That part is, is pretty nascent. There's nothing that's happening on that side. There is a whole lot of uh, stuff happening on the, uh, on the uh, robotics front because uh, there is two stream of robotics that's driven by AI that's, you know, um, and, and both I be believe are controlled by uh, or, or funded by SoftBank as of today. One is the side which actually are more physical in nature, um, which can do all kinds of physical activities, jump and all that, right? Um, the other other side is around humanoids, which can actually driven by AI and ML, they can interact with humans, help them out in certain things. So this is kind of maturing now or actually coming around. Um, there are no expert systems that are driven by AI as of today. There are mostly robotic systems, um, which, which have some amount of expertise being fed into them based on which industry they're gonna be used in, but expert systems are lacking. So if you look at these boxes, what we want AI to be, or the future state to be, is something called inferential reasoning. That doesn't happen in AI today, right? AI is mostly inferential statistics. It's not come around to the reasoning right now. But what is the state of the art today, if we have to really discuss that? So the state of the art today is things like, it looks at a picture and can say it's a container ship, right? Uh, it looks at an animal and you can say it's a leopard and it can say it's a scooter. Um, you, on the right side, you see a, a, a screen grab from Tesla, right? Um, it, it's a semi-autonomous drive wherein the cars can, you know, drive in a semi-autonomous mode. But if you look at, um, you know, the visual processing that happens through the camera, you can see it can identify traffic on the, on the uh, road and it can uh, identify cars and other objects there, right? And then you had AlphaGo actually defeating a human at the game, right? Um, IBM itself actually had a much publicized event around Jeopardy a game wherein humans were defeated by Watson, um, the IBM AI powered uh, computer. Um, it was a little different. Um, most of us are used to a search paradigm. In case of the Jeopardy thing that was done, it was a little different wherein you were just giving the clues to the machine, right? And machine could figure out based on the clues what you were talking about. That was a little different. So that's the state of the art where we are today. Now where we are going is that we have gone to a stage wherein we can train machines to describe things. So for example, it can look at a, a, a picture and it can describe what's happening there. So for example, a man in black shirt is playing the guitar. So you, you show that to a machine today based on ML and AI processing, it can actually um, describe uh, a picture, not the whole scene though. People are working on describing a whole scene or a sequence of scenes, but you know, you can describe a picture. Uh, one of the other things that's happening today um, as, as part of the state of the art is something called transfer learning. So you can actually transfer learning from one model to another model. So what you see here is you see the, the face of a female and a uh, a painting on the right side. You today have a way of a model to learn the painting style and actually transfer the painting style onto the face um, of the female. So 
So what that, that is one of the manifestation of how you can do a style transfer or transfer learning. So you've learned how to paint and you can transfer it. So that allows us to actually maintain models rather than train them every time you can maintain models for specific tasks and they can, they can transfer their learning. I'm showing you a photo of Mandir Bedi. I mean, IBM did one of the demos at, at one of the events for Vogue, the magazine. And we actually were showing that we had a humanoid robot which could take photographs of people and actually do a painting of you know, people based on Picasso or any other style. And then you see a deep dream uh, photo on the right side wherein uh, a machine can describe how it sees uh, objects, right? It sees them in this way. And then it, it it will match objects in one of the quadrants here, or one of the specs of the image here, and that's how they go about it. So this is, this is the state of the art today. Uh, even speech recognition for that matter is a, is a more, mostly a quasi visual recognition because the speech is actually converted into a visual representation like what's being shown below. Um, um, and and um, that a visual recognition is applied on that. So what has been found is there is more accuracy gained by actually representing a speech or, or, or the words or, or whatever we utter into visual representation and actually uh, and process them. So that's as far as the state of the art for speech. Now, why am I showing you a whole lot of images? By, because most of the processing that humans do primarily is done through uh, only one medium and that's visual, right? And the percentage of this data that we process is 81%. So most of us, even though we may be communicating through different mediums, but the processing of data the human brain does is mostly visual. So that's why a lot of effort has gone into actually um, determining how we can, um, you know, tackle the visual part of the AI problem in such a way that it actually goes accurate. It can, you know, um, um, differentiate between objects. It can, it, so for example, in the image there, it can not only can it differentiate between different objects, it can also try and correlate, you know, a person is there, if the person is standing, what's, what does she have in hand and all that. Latest one um, the, uh, uh, is a research published by, I, I think, Facebook. It's called Detectron, which is, I think, available on GitHub as an open source code. It allows you to even segment objects inside um, an image. So, for example, you see on the um, left bottom the segmentation kind of thing that's been done. So you see a person on a horse, and then this image part can be segmented so that you know exactly where in the image are certain objects. So those localization of, and, and instances of how many uh, of those are present. So for example, if there are two bikes, it can segment and find there are two bikes or two drivers kind of a thing. This processing is important because obviously this has to happen for things like autonomous driving in real time. So th this is the medium that is the most mature medium as far as AI processing goes. Um, AI is, um, is actually going uh, next stage now. It's called inferential learning. So what that means is, let me, let me talk through the example I'm showing on the screen now. So we have a model that's trained for man with glasses. So it'll look at an image and it'll say, oh, there's a man with a glass. Now, um, similarly, we can train a model man without glasses, okay? And we can have a third model which is trained for women without glasses. So you actually had three data sets, not related to each other, train on a totally different thing. So, you know, man without glasses, man with glasses and women without glasses. Now, the, what inferential learning does is you can combine these models together to actually infer a new learning. So, which means you don't have to provide a new training or a new set of or a model to identify a woman with glasses on the right side. Based on the inferential learning it does from one model to the other, uh, it can identify new data set that it has not been trained on. So for, for example, in this case, none of the models we had was trained to identify women with glasses. It could infer how glasses look like. It could infer how male or female look like, right? It could put the learning together and transfer the learning from one to the other and infer a new image. That's the state of the art as far as the AI goes. And this, this obviously is not relegated only to visual, but this has wide ranging implications for industry wherein you can have inferential models build up as a base layer for multiple use cases or objects. And then you don't have to train it for new thing. 
one of one of the newer thing that's happening is for retail industry for example you you don't you, you don't have to take newer picture for newer objects that come up so for example if you have a new shirt or a t-shirt launch and you you don't actually have to take a new photo with the model again today uh, you basically based on something called gan generative adversarial net, uh, networks you can actually um, produce a new image infer a new image based on a new t-shirt without actually model having taken that photograph ever so so this is this is the latest thing that's happening as far as the ai goes and this this is pretty much uh, important because sometimes for some of the stuff that you want to do you don't have enough data available now what ai helps you with it, it can it can produce some of this synthetic data for you so so that you can you can tackle that uh, use case so for example for aircraft damage let's say you want to train a model today there, there are not enough images available specific models uh, of aircraft, for example. How do you do that then? You, you can't just go with 10 images and tell uh, AI that, you know, in future you identify how the damage looks like. What that means is today you have an ability where an AI can produce damage um, or synthetic data for damage on aircrafts and then train itself. So this, this, this is the latest state of the art um, inferential uh, learning part of it. Now, but there are challenges that, that we are hitting right now when, when we are going for it. Um, the, the thing that's happening is it's, it's, uh, it's very challenging to extract useful information from unlabeled data. So for example, um, I, I deal pretty often with some of the banks and then try to do some kind of fraud detection around, around card usage, online usage, et cetera. There are fraud engines that are there, et cetera. But, biggest problem when we have to apply AI or machine learning to that kind of a data, for example, is you do not have enough fraud data. So the number of transactions that happens through the bank per day is, is cumulatively around a, a terabyte of data that's there. In that terabyte of data, there'll be probably only 0.3% of, of fraud transaction. It's very, 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 very hard to actually extract any useful information to be able to train the machine learning on just 0.3% of data, right? So that, that's one of the challenge. Um, the, the AI neural nets, that, that's uh, one of the in things today from um, you know, state of the art, they work quite well, right? But are they the final answer? I think no, right? Um, it, it's, it's becoming difficult to develop a theoretical understanding of why a neural network says this is a dog versus cat. Because it's a black box, right? There is, there is no way we are actually able to find out how did a model arrive at a decision to say this is good or bad. Now for enterprises, it's, it's okay for this to, to be published as a paper. It's okay for this to be showcased as a demonstration. But when you have to put this kind of um, um, processing, let's say for a bank, for you being declined a card or a transaction on your card, a bank has to be able to audit every action that was taken based on an AI or ML model and be able to say why it was declined. Now the decline can be false positive also, right? So, but neural nets are, are more or less like a black box. You can't define them. Um, and the models are getting too specialized. So for example, models are very, very specialized for a specific task in a scenario. You, you today do not, it's very difficult or we are finding it very difficult to make uh, a generic model then can then can act um, a scenario wide or a domain wide. That's that's very very uh, difficult. We're trying to tap into the potential of transfer learning to see if there is a way we can use transfer learning to build generic model. But you know you, you can imagine I I today do not have a model that allows me to look at anything and say these this is the um, genus animal and under animal it can classify all kind of thing. There, there's nothing like that that exists today. Um, you actually have specialized models for domestic animals versus wild animals versus all kind of things or you need to have those pictures together, all kind of issues that we face there. Um, and you, you can imagine if we had to do transfer learning, we had to build it from ground up. Um, how many models are you looking at? That actually for enterprises is a difficulty today. And then, then it comes to scale for distributed big data. So... Uh, more, most of the AI demonstrations that we keep uh, seeing today, most of the publications that appear today, can you imagine when it has to happen in real time 
on on distributed big data like um, that, that that a country like ours produces is going to be humongous it's going to be difficult it doesn't scale ai today has not been tested at real high scale so um, th this is one of the lacunas in the sense most of it is in the demonstration and you know proof and uh, proof of concept or prototype stage um, if I was to say there are not too many AI use cases that have been distro, you know, distributed for scale, not too many. I think, I think the biggest example of this is Google Maps. I think that's the only one that I see is distributed for scale, a lot of data, and people are using it, but not too many examples there. What is the technology landscape that looks like today for AI? I have this chart that's going to be on your screen now, which is trying to cover most around what's happening around AI. So you have computer vision, neural networks, speech recognition. I'm going to go um, uh, counterclockwise. So you have you know, speech recognition, deep learning, chatbots, right? machine reasoning, some amount of effort that people are trying to put into this as a separate subject and see if we can come up with something on that. Natural language processing, knowledge representation, and as I said, again, you know, there are separate efforts. Every vendor has their own way of doing it. Image recognition, machine learning, virtual agent. So chatbots and virtual agents are a little different. Chatbot is a simple chat, you know, question answer kind of thing. Virtual agent can essentially be even in the form of a robot, right? And then autonomics, wherein you have robotic processes actually trying to do uh, uh, most of the stuff uh, of processing through AI, for example, loan application, you know, processing, you know, document verification, matching data, etc. All that can be put through autonomics and, and go about it. So this is more or less like the kind of technology landscape that exists today. There, there are, there's much beyond that research works on, but these are the ones that are, are being offered through different vendors. But what, what is the vendor landscape and uh, competitive landscape from IBM point of view look like? Um, let, let's look at this chart from below. So at, at the bottom, you have something called infrastructure. Um, you know, you have infrastructure as a platform, as a cloud. Cloud can be private, public. Uh, but the biggest vendors there are Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, IBM, HP. Um, one name that crops up here and then most people are not aware of, I have not been looking through is Alibaba. China has been investing heavily into this right i think they're serious about it they have good infrastructure going so you have you have players who are actually providing infrastructure for you to be able to develop ai that's one or deploy ai that's that's the bottom part then let's start from left to right then you have uh, players who are actually providing you apis for certain of uh, the technology landscape chart that i had shown below as apis right it's more or less like you can plug and play. You just, just use the API, let's say, for visual recognition and help you do that. So there are only four players there or, or four major players there, right? So it's Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and IBM. So they allow you APIs around speech, text, uh, NLP, vision. Um, uh, th there are a few. Everybody has their own special. IBM has its own. Amazon has its own kind of thing. So then, so you, you have the API vendors. This is, this is where most of the developer community is working with. Um, then comes the custom engagement part of it. This is proprietary wherein everybody has a solution based on, on, um, on AI and then they are offering. So for example, Accenture offers something, Google offers something, right? So proprietary, for example, means um, uh, uh, internal fraud detection, right, uh, for securities and exchange. So you, you're, you're dealing with stocks. Um, you may be tr transacting um, as well as interacting with the customers. We can actually identify if a fraud is happening by looking at all your emails and chats and other data that you're doing and correlate them to transactions, dates, timeline to really find our have you been planning for certain transactions or not? So something like that. There are proprietary solutions. Um, there, there are niche players in this area. They assemble their own stuff be using AI and then they deliver. Um, when they are doing that, if you look at the bottom part of this box, most of the technology they are using is open source. And TensorFlow stands out there. Um, apart from TensorFlow, the, the, there are a few other, but Google actually has released this library a few years ago, and they, they've been you know, releasing uh, um, 
updates to it. And this seems to be the most popular library as far as you know, visual and speech and other part goes. Uh, obviously, for text part, there are a few other CNTK. You have you know Scikit, Scikit Image, MXNet, all kind of thing. But the the important part to say is when you look at the infrastructure, you look at the API based vendors. All of them are just providing the platform or the infrastructure, but the technology they are using underlying is all open source. So if you have to train a visual recognition model today. You can simply just use an open source uh, uh, piece of library to build that. When it comes to deployment, you can choose your vendor. Then there's the other side um, on the right, it's called chatbot devs and assistant. A lot of work is happening. So AI adoption is gonna be slow. As of now, everybody thinks just design a chatbot and you are on for AI. And that's not the truth. That's half truth in the sense, you're just starting on the journey, you're not there. Um, so again, there, there are different vendors there and it, those are highlighted there. So there are bot development vendors who have their own platform that allow you to develop a chatbot quickly without you having to really worry about the, the whole infrastructure as well as the design of it. Uh, then obviously there are vendors that actually give you assistant. So for example, uh, you have Alexa's of the world and IBM has something called a button that it deploy with some of our retail customers to really just order at the press of a button. Just speak into it and you know, it'll, it'll order that uh, item for you. Then obviously there are business facing on the right side that you see the box. They, they have based on their, uh, their primary product portfolio, they are embedding AI into that and they are offering that as part of the upgrade of their packages. For example, SAP is going after upgrade um, and they have AI embedded um, into some of their products that they sell out. For example, Microsoft, you look at it, the, the, the most money-making thing there would be Office, I believe, and AI is getting embedded into their Office suite of products, right? Same goes for Google. Google, you know, doesn't seem to charge for too many things, but they have, they have AI embedded as part of their product portfolio that people use, and, and that's being offered as a business app. So this is how the technology and the landscape around these technologies looks like. This is how it's being played out in the market today. But the biggest disruptors are not the vendors on the previous slide. The biggest dis disruptors are the startups. AI is one of those technologies that's gonna be driven by, changed by, and actually matured by startups. So the platform vendors, the infrastructure vendors, the API vendors, they all have a hiccup in actually using AI to really do something meaningful because you have a limited staff, you're always working for platform products, et cetera, but it's the AI startups who are actually focusing mainly on how do you use them? And they are spread across. So robots and vehicles, FinTech, EdTech, um, travel, transport, HR, you name it and you, you will find one startup there. Most of the money is being poured into health the healthcare industry is gonna mature the most on AI. The most amount of money um, for investment for startups is going into healthcare. That's gonna be big. Um, and they are disruptors. They are setting the trend as to how the usage of AI is gonna be. And they, they just don't uh, you know, exist only in the, only in the uh, space I was showing you at the, uh, at the previous slide. They're all across, all across different industries, all across different platforms, you name it and you have it. So biggest takeaway, if I have to is, tell you today, is the startup ecosystem is gonna drive how the adoption of AI and its processes is gonna happen for the businesses. The technology vendor are just gonna be the providers of technology. The adopters are gonna be these startup ecosystems. Um, let me take you through some of the industry use cases just to um, keep you engaged as to how it's, whether it's being used and how it's being used. So it's being used in multiple ways. You do see facial recognition, et cetera, but one of the things that's being used at ATMs today is something called masked face detection. So you may have your face being covered, but is there a way for us to identify your face, even if it is masked with cap or a hoodie or something, right? So that, that's one big thing that's coming up wherein um, there is some amount of serious work that has happened. There, there's, there's actually a paper even published by Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore 
um, to really to really say how uh, you can you how or what is the approach you can do to do um, mass phase detection. This is this is going to be applied in multiple places, ATMs, different buildings, government buildings, etc. Um, one of the other use cases that's getting used pretty. Um, you know, it is going to be used pretty frequently by insurance agencies. It's going to be distracted driver detection. So your data is actually being captured all the time from your driving behavior, etc. But if there is a visual camera that's put in, it can actually know and record whether you are getting distracted or not, right? So if you if you look at the the, uh, the way it's going to correlate the data from your IoT sensors and the visual part of it, and really find out if an accident happened because you were distracted. Um, insurance agencies are actively looking at using some of this kind of a data and approach. Then you have price optimization, kind of a use case scenario wherein uh, insurance agencies are looking at the damage, where the damage occurred, the profile of the customer demographics, et cetera, and putting it together to really find what is the most optimal price to offer for an insurance, right? So you will have made to order insurance packages pretty soon. A lot of companies are doing that. I think it's not caught up that much in India as of now, but this is gonna be one of the major things that's gonna come in. Based on how you drive, how you have, uh, you know, um, how, how many cars you've had, how many accidents you've had, all kind of demographic data that goes in along with that. And, and you'll have a custom priced insurance package for you. Um, then, then there's obviously, um, you know, car damage classification that needs to happen as to which part was damaged, what was the extent of the damage, uh, replaceable, not replaceable, etc. that can be done. So that, that's again, all, all these are actively used. You have agents that go out, take the photo, submit it back, and those are classified at the back using a machine learning algorithm that actually, um, you know, allows the insurance companies to process your claims faster. A lot of interest is being shown by retail industry in using AI to really do the placement of their products to see where the heat maps are being generated as to which counter are people going to the most, where are they spending their time the most, um, um, yeah, where are they gazing at. So you have cameras deployed to really do a gaze analysis, heat maps of where you were walking. And more importantly, they can start looking at if there are threats that uh, occur in a larger supermarket kind of a space, so it can identify weapons and actually, you know, start an alarm wherein the person who's holding the weapon won't even know that alarm has been triggered. Uh, coming to one of the you know, ones that we face often is at the airport, there are long queues, there are people who are looking at these images trying to find out it's good, bad, ugly. Uh, what AI, um, I, I think there's a con, I think there's a contest um, there on Kaggle uh, launched by one of the agencies in US to really look at uh, these images, X-ray images of, of uh, your luggage and find out um, objects um, which are prohibited. So it can be a nail, it can be a gun, it can be a hammer, anything. So what, what it allows you to do is as soon as the scanned image comes up on the screen, there's going to be focus areas highlighted to say these, these are banned items. Probably you should look at that. So it allows the person who's manning the station to actually be very focused. Then obviously uh, th there are peculiar models that have been developed to really say um, th there are different type of guns. Um, and more importantly, you can't check the guns all the time because now because of 3D printing, you actually have people printing some of this, which is not detectable by some of the metallic detectors. And uh, the only way of dealing with that now is that under a second today, you can actually identify a gun through a camera, a CCTV camera and raise an alarm. So something like that is being deployed at multiple places. Multiple uh, ven uh, vendors want to use it. Banking is the most important one that's starting to use it now, wherein they have CCTVs deployed everywhere. And they say, anytime you have weapons being displayed, or taken out in a bank or a branch, and it should trigger an alarm. And then you have um, other vendors. For example, you have uh, you have people working on shop floor wherein they need to wear their safety equipment. Um, it's not always so they may they may wear it at the checkpoint and then they go and then probably put it down. For example, you may wear the helmet at the checkpoint, but go in, and when you're working at the shop floor, you may take it off. 
So um, there are models being deployed, especially for aircraft manufacturing kind of scenarios, wherein they want people to be very careful on where they put stuff, what they are putting, um, etc. And and uh, the the AI is always tracking through CCTVs their movements and whether they are really adhering to the norms, protective equipment norms, etc. Uh, then there's 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 this menace of uh, drones that are there. So there there's been a few models that have been developed and deployed to say it can identify the drones flying, um, especially in a restricted area, and raise an alarm. So you can't have people manning um, your campus all the time, but you can have cameras looking up outwards, and they can actually find uh, drones when they are coming nearby and raise an alarm. And accuracy has been pretty pretty good with drones now. There, there are certain use cases when people are asking for a rough count in crowded areas. Seems strange, but yes. So there is a way today, uh, uh, um, some of the AI models have been trained to really give you uh, some amount of rough count around uh, how the crowd was, was it unruly, etc. But you know, what, what the rough count of the crowd was from still images. So density of the crowd kind of thing. Uh, there is um, there is a whole lot of uses that's happening around sound classification. I believe there are apps that exist on some of your mobiles today that that um, record your ambient uh, noises, and they classify the noise. And actually, that allows uh, marketing companies to to know really um, at what point of time are you looking at what. So, for example, if you're you know, it can it can look at um, record ambient noise and say you, you're you're probably sitting um, in an air conditioning room, or if you're driving a car, or or you're doing some drilling, or if you're watching a TV. I believe there's a company based out of Bangalore that even has these signatures recorded for each of the channels that we have in India, and they can tell from ambient noise which channel are you watching at what point of time. That helps the marketing companies to really know your preferences. So th this is an active use, the sound classification use cases. Um, the biggest money-making use cases where uh, a lot of money is being poured by every player, whether it is IBM, Google, or others, is around healthcare. Everybody is serious about it because um, uh, th that's, that's where uh, AI can play a lot of role to actually help doctors process things faster, efficiently, in an optimized way. So, you know, use cases around radiology analysis. Let me just step through around your skin allergies and, and skin cancers. It can really look at that and find out much better accurate than humans is what is being said as of now. Then it can look at tumors and classify where exactly. So if you look at the image that I'm showing, the, the color variations in the image is mostly around purple. It may, may be very difficult for you to identify all the tumors, but, you know, the models have been pretty accurate around it mostly 90% and above, to really say whether tumor is, is there or not. Um, it's there for demoscopic images, etc. So that, that's another area there where a whole lot of work has happened, a whole lot of uh, models exist for different players today to really do that. Um, it can do a lung cancer detection based on uh, images that are taken for your lung. A lot of money has gone in there. I've never um, put in um, and where uh, probably Google has published a lot of paper, but there are most number of startups that are working towards that. And a few few really good startups are around diabetic retinopathy. Um, and, and for a country like India, there are a lot, there are a few startups that are real, real serious players here. So you may, you may want to Google search for some of the players that are there in this so uh, and um, th they are doing some serious work around the healthcare industry um, th the big players that have put in the the wind turbines they also are using ai today they send the drones and the drones actually take the images but instead of sending all the images drones have certain models running inside of them uh, using raspberry pi and some of the other uh, uh, embeddable devices and they can actually find out if there are damages on blades of the uh, turbine, etc. Similarly, you have you can identify these logos on different vehicles if they are you know entering a certain city area or a certain road, and the cameras can flag that. So you you essentially have restricted uh, movement of these material inside a city, and the AI can control that today and flag it whenever uh, these some of these restricted material is entering through the vehicles into an area. 
And obviously, government is very, very interested in the crop identification and the status of the crops, right? Um, a lot of work has gone in there. Um, the models have been trained to look at it and actually find out where exactly uh, in a field uh, the crop density is more versus less, good versus bad, etc. So you can see some of the images being captured there. Um, a lot of state governments have shown interest in actually looking at that because of the insurance that's being launched for farmers today. Uh, there's obviously classified data that exists through uh, remote sensing images and you want to classify changes that happen on a certain GPS location, models can do that today for you, right? Instead of humans having to look at that, you can have data coming in from satellite feed all the time and whenever changes occur, the model can flag those. Uh, for high speed rail infrastructure, the, the biggest problem, for example, there is that birds actually make nests there and that leads to some issues. Uh, there are models that have been trained to look at uh, the uh, uh, rail infrastructure and, and um, you know, point out anomalies. So you can send drones to fly around this infrastructure and they will take videos and actually flag whenever they find anomaly like a bird nest or something. So these are some of the use cases I just wanted to share with you to say there is some uh, real work uh, or real adoption that has already happened in the industry and they are, they are in use today. But what are the trends looking like? Where is the technology going? Let me just quickly cover that. The biggest trend is semi-structured data and you'll hear a lot about it in, in, in coming uh, days and years is that we, we keep talking about structured, unstructured data and big data and all that. One of the things that has been ignored the most and this chart is trying to show that is by 2020, the biggest pie is this grayed out portion. So there is, there is this dark green, which is structured and the light green, which is unstructured, but in between is semi-structured data, right? This is gonna make a whole lot of difference and we are working seriously to really look at how do we process that. So what do I mean by that? Is things like PDF. For corporates, for industries, for, for enterprises, the biggest knowledge world today is PDFs. So everything we do, we just, just print it out onto PDF, we capture it onto PDF and just dump it somewhere. They hold enormous amount of knowledge and there's a way that AI can help us extract that. So one of the ways it's showing you on the screen now, you can write parsers that can interpret it and represent it semantically. And then, you know, you can look at a chart that's there in the PDF and look at the trend there and represent that semantic to say it's a good trend, bad trend, et cetera. All those things are actually happening. So you can, you can, you can expect to actually have APIs or tools available that will allow you to extract knowledge out of PPTs and PDFs, et cetera. That's humongous amount of knowledge that's already lying around that we can process. Um, document segmentation and document processing is becoming really, really big. You can have more uh, model strain to really find out where signatures are, matching of signatures, address, all the processing that we do today, which is getting manual and humans actually looking at it is going to go away pretty soon. All the document processing would more or less uh, is pretty soon going to be robotic uh, process automation driven backed by AI. Uh, one of the newer trends, at least in IBM that we're doing is we are building a way of, or, or build, uh, you know, finding a way of building layered AI models. So, you know, wh what that means is you can have a base model, which actually identifies images. Then you can have industry model that identifies images only for insurance industry. And then you can customize on top of that, what exactly is, is a damage versus known damage, right? So instead of building one, a monolithic model or one piece of thing that is only specific for a task we have found out a way of doing layered development so that you can you can probably deploy two of these and customize the third one based on UCAs, the customer that comes in or 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 how the data is there so this is this is again the new trend that's going to be there you will have base models you have industry AI models and you will have customizations happening on top of that uh, the other trend um, that's going to catch a pretty pretty much is you will have a hybrid solution approach to everything that is around deep learning and machine learning. Most of the stuff that's re related to AI today is driven by deep learning. But what's happening is deep learning needs a whole lot of data, but you may not have data available for all the scenarios. That's where we are, we are doing a hybrid approach. What that allows you to do is you can actually have 
a deep learning model giving you basic features, which is uh, combined with the machine learning to do a faster training and, and more accurate uh, classification of things. So that's hybrid deep learning and machine learning models is, is one of the other trends that's going to catch up pretty fast. It's already being applied, uh, but, but uh, I, I think the developer community still needs to adopt it. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we face today is how do we train AI for reasoning? especially for enterprises where you actually have to put a process for AI in such a way that it's auditable. Reasoning is very, very difficult because as I said in one of these slides earlier, neural nets are like black boxes. You cannot define them. You can't audit them as of today. Now, what do I, what, what, what for example, IBM Research has been working on and, and probably the software lab is going to put that pretty soon in, in some of our product portfolio is something called reasoning based on evidence and knowledge graph. What that means is you will soon have a way for us to define a knowledge graph by humans and a machine learning model identifying parts. So what that means is, for example, you will have a machine learning model that will say, oh, th there seems to be a wing here and looks like this is an insect, right? And it has a carapace, right? And it will be compared to a knowledge graph and knowledge graph will do the deduction and reasoning for you and say, if there is a kind of insect which has wing and which has a carapace, then looks like this is an arthropod. So you do not today have to actually train a model to identify an arthropod. You can do a reasoning based on uh, the evidence and the knowledge graphs to really come out with newer stuff. So that's how we'll be building base models, which will do evidence you will uh, combine them with customized model along with knowledge graphs so that you can have a way of doing reasoning. And um, um, just to give an example, uh, you know, most people think that it's easier to implement, but state of the art today doesn't allow you to do that. So let's say if we were to ask you a question and say, in May 1898, Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of the explorer's arrival in India. And you give it an evidence today saying in May, Gary around in India after he celebrated his anniversary in Portugal, the state of the art today uh, is going to do this. It's going to do a matching between celebrated to celebrated, May to May, 400th anniversary. So it'll match anniversary word to anniversary, Portugal to Portugal, India to India, and it'll say Gary is the answer. So this is the state of the art, by the way. Existing technologies is based on referencing the text, keyword matching, and, and you know, cobbling together an answer. And, and most, of the, most of the responses that you see through Twitter handles that are mostly driven by a virtual agent or chatbots are doing this kind of stuff today. And this is where the, the situation becomes hilarious. When people, I mean, you, you want to complain to a Twitter handle in a sarcastic way, and you will always get a response which is more, more, more annoying to you because they are just doing, you know, a keyword matching and just probably thinking you, you, you're, you're your um, you, you're satisfied customer, you, you want to applaud them, etc. It has happened a few times with Indigo and some of the other airlines, right? Now, what I mean by inferential reasoning that the way I was saying earlier, which AI is going to be, is something like this. For example, if I say the same question, but I give the evidence on 27th May, 1498, Vasco da Gama landed in Kapad Beach, right? If we were to do this uh, processing today, what happens is you can do a, a layered matching of this. So first you will do a temporal reasoning. So you will say, what time frame are we talking about? So 400th anniversary uh, is matching to something like May 1498 from the current date, right? It can match that. Then it can do some kind of a paraphrasing to say arrival and landed, maybe the same thing, right? Uh, then it can do uh, some kind of a geospatial reasoning saying, India and Kapad Beach probably are hierarchically same because Kapad Beach may be under India, right? And it can actually come out with the inferential reasoning answer. That answer is Vasco da Gama. This, this is where AI is going to prog progress. So what that means is if you see at the right side where I'm showing the legend, temporal reasoning, statistical paraphrasing, geospatial reasoning, reference text, etc. All of these are machine learning or deep learning models that are going to be put together and using a knowledge graph kind of a matching the way you're seeing here, they can actually do some kind of a reasoning. Um, 
we, we've been pretty serious about it and we actually uh, did a demo of something called IBM Debater, which could actually debate with humans on a given subject. It, it's not a general purpose debater, but we had achieved a way or a methodology of actually uh, debating with humans on a very specific subject. So uh, what AI is gonna be in future is, today it understands and learns, right? And it does interaction through speech to text, text to speech and visually. But the reasoning uh, bubble that you see here, that's gonna become very, very uh, serious development in future. Uh, that, that's going to give more heft to AI and its adoption. Uh, for us, uh, obviously, we have our own brand called Watson, which is which is supposed to be the brain for the enterprise, which actually um, does have a way of doing a whole lot of um, stuff that's lacking. So it does, you know, deal with languages, does deal with speech, vision, empathy, right? Uh, knowledge organization, reasoning. So we have found out a way of putting that together and actually, um, you know, you know, offering that as products or APIs. So with that, I'll just stop at this slide, probably take some questions because we don't have too much of time left. Let me stop sharing and go to probably Q and A. Okay, so I'll just, just get started with a few that's, um, okay, seems agenda is for non-developers was expecting techno. Okay, one hour is not, not gonna be sufficient for technical exposure. I'm not gonna talk about algorithms in an hour. The idea is to cover a larger audience on where AI is um, and um, where it's gonna be. Okay, I'll just do away with the poll for now. Uh, as a beginner, how can one start to learn AI, ML and AI from scratch? Well, there are courses being offered by different vendors today. I mean, I think there are few that are paid. There are few that you can start with. From I, I can answer that from IBM point of view. IBM has something called uh, Analytics University that you can start with. That should be a good start for you to uh, um, get started with in AI and ML. Apart from that, there are Coursera and other courses that are there. Uh, transfer learning is in infancy. Deep learning really requires a lot of data. As I said, we have found out or we have researched on ways to really you know, circumvent the requirement of data for deep learning, wherein we are saying you can build a layered uh, approach to building models and you don't need too much of data for all, all the different uh, scenarios to do transfer learning. Uh, what is the difference between AI? Sorry. What is the difference AI and predictive? Predictive is mostly uh, uh, is mostly feature data. Um, you know, it is feature engineer data wherein you are just predicting uh, one output. Um, it's not multiple classification kind of thing. AI, on the other hand, doesn't need to be uh, uh, feature engineer data. It can be raw data. You can give it. Uh, but more importantly, predictive falls more around statistical approach to uh, predicting something. AI remains more around inferential approach to uh, uh, predicting something. Uh, if we need to get into AI and ML, what technology would be the gateway? I think the biggest gateway should be you, you should be familiar with Python or R as a language. That's where most of the packages and open source uh, libraries reside. Uh, Any use case or example of how education system is benefited? Um, one of the use case for um, you know, education uh, adopting AI is there, there are virtual reality driven courses for students that are getting designed today, which will be AI driven that based on your responses and your feedback through a simulation in VR, you will have uh, uh, the, the education package being tailored to your need in real time and, and, and the VR itself being produced in real time using AI rather than you actually having to program it. Uh, is AI used by government for contract negotiation and regulation? Um, I would not want to answer that. Let the government answer that. Uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow, which is better for deep learning. Uh, my, ex uh, my experience, TensorFlow. 
power utilized domain, which kind of lags in terms of data, how do you see some can help in terms of destruction. In actually power and utilities domain, there is a lot of data, just that the data is not getting captured in a proper way. That's the only, only. so for example, today there are turbine companies um, who have these, these complex uh, turbines that are producing a, a, a electric, elect, electricity in India and abroad. They produce humongous amount of data, just that it's not get captured in a way it can be fed to an AI model today. That that's where it is. It is getting stuck. Otherwise, you have a lot of data in um, power and utilities domain. You provided example for banking sector. What kind of sorry accuracy being achieved? In, say, now one, one one of the fallacies that happens in AI is that you should not really go after only an accuracy of a model you would want to see whether the model is actually able to interpret and work on that data. Accuracy comes with time and repeated learning of the model, especially in banking we have found. There is no way for us to achieve a 90% kind of an accuracy for a fraud detection kind of thing. So usually the best way of approaching that is even if you achieve a 70% kind of accuracy, then you will combine that with a set of rules. So rules plus AI model output is what usually works best um, for banking and fraud kind of use cases. What is a good place to start with inferential learning? Um, just Google for Google for Pi image search and um, transfer learning. And I think there, there's a book that's published by the person there that's very, very informative. Thanks, Mr. Vishal. Great, thank you everyone. We appreciate you being here. We will send you the recordings by tomorrow. Visit springpeople.com for upcoming webinars, connect LND webinars, tech webinars, and conclaves. Thank you again for joining us today's webinar.